It gives me a great uh, deal of pleasure tonight to introduce to you one of my um, oldest and most beloved and deeply respected Dharma friends and compatriots and teachers, um, Ajahn Sumedho. Um, you know how sometimes in your life there's somebody that you meet and they completely change your life? Well, he's been that for me. Um, you know, meeting him completely changed the whole of my life. Um, so I'm really glad I met him. Because <laughs> it's turned out pretty good so far. <laughs> um, uh, he was in the Peace Corps as I had been in Asia, but a bit before me. He was in Borneo in the um, early 60s and then went to Thailand and became inspired by Buddhist practice. He'd studied about it in the university, in Berkeley or University of, uh, in Washington State, and um, ordained as a monk. And um, I met him uh, after he'd been ordained for a couple of years. I heard there was a Western monk in the province where I was working in the Peace Corps also, and I guess it was in 1967 at that time that I met him. And I was looking for a teacher and had studied Buddhism myself, but didn't really have a teacher to be with. Um, and I met Ajahn Sumedho, and he told me about his experience. He'd, he'd just spent a, a rains retreat and part of a year with uh, Ajahn Chah. Um, and from his description, I became very inspired. I became inspired by meeting him. Um, it was a very unlikely thing to run into a Western monk at that time. And so I went immediately um, in the following months down to Wat Bapong to this monastery. And Ajahn Chah became both my teacher and really um, the place where I learned um, uh, both meditation practice and really the kind of wisdom that comes in the Buddhist tradition. And so in that way I feel a, a kind of unrepayable gratitude to Ajahn Sumedho for doing that um, as a benefactor. Um, and it wasn't just at that time, although I met Ajahn Sumedho, it was again 1967 and I heard rumors about this Western monk, so I, I got a jeep, I was working in village medical teams, and we went out to this distant part of this province and um, walked up a trail that was like 2,000 steps and a long winding trail up to the top of this um, mountain ridge where there was Cambodian temple ruins on top, Wat Pupek. And among these ruins, um, ancient ruins, were a few small wooden huts for monks to stay with tin roofs, if I recall. And Ajahn Sumedho was sitting on the porch of one of these huts when I walked up. Um, he wasn't Ajahn Sumedho at that point, which means teacher. He was just um, Tan Sumedho, he's the monk. Um, and there he was, this very tall and pale-looking <laughs> person in robes um, uh, 28 years ago. Um, and he was sitting there, and first I kind of paid my respects, hello, and sat down, was happy to see him. Um, and then I noticed that he had bees all over him. And so I said, what's with the bees? <laughs> And he explained that he'd been up there staying at the monastery for a while in this hut, come up not that long ago with, a, with another Thai monk to live together, and moved into this hut where there was a kind of beehive. And at first he'd thought about how to get rid of the bees and smoke them out or whatever you would do to get rid of the bees. And then he said he'd realized that he was a, uh, a Buddhist monk who was trying to live in harmony or peace with all the creatures of the world, and beside which they were using the upper part of the hut, and he only had to use the lower part of the hut. And so he would sort of made, made an arrangement. And I knew I had met an unusual person. <laughs> and he has been unusual and wonderful since that time. Um, I then, after being inspired by his description of his own teacher and by him and his practice. I went and met Ajahn Chah several times and decided to ordain and become a monk and went to that monastery. Um, and then we were 
both kind of young, struggling monks together. Although I learned a lot from Ajahn Sumedho because he'd done it before me. And I was sort of the skinny young monk that he once in a while would say was too young to understand certain things, <laughs> which may still be true. <laughs> um, and over the years then, Ajahn Sumedho has become, uh, as he's matured and grown in his own practice, not just an inspiration to myself, a continuing one, but to many others. A huge number of Western practitioners came, inspired by Ajahn Chah, who um, was one of the wisest men that you could imagine meeting, um, and by Ajahn Sumedho, who was the senior Western monk and who really carries in many ways that same wisdom and humor and simplicity and straightforwardness from Ajahn Chah. A very great dedication as well. He's become the abbot of a succession of monasteries, the first Westerner to be an abbot in Thailand of a Western monastery, and then brought by Ajahn Chah to England and dropped off there, left there, to become an <laughs> abbot of a, of a small monastery in the middle of London, which was not so fitting for a forest monk. But then one day out on alms, alms, he would go out with his alms bowl every day, and people sometimes would put things in and mostly not. And One day he was out in the park and someone was jogging by and asked, what are you? And he said, well, I'm a forest monk. <laughs> But actually, I live in an apartment in London because that's what's been offered, and we take what people offer. He said, but I'm really a forest monk. And this man said, that, oh, he had a uh, forest that he was looking for something to do with. So <laughs> even though he didn't put food in Ajahn Sumedho's bowl, he gave him a beautiful forest, which they have now made into a, an extraordinary monastery in, in England. And where many other people have come in, in the past decades and longer to try to create Buddhist monasteries in the West, often they've failed. And in part, I think they've failed because they've used the monastic life in order to meditate or practice or have some special experience and get enlightened. And um, Ajahn Sumedho hasn't used it in that way. And by not doing so, he's, he's succeeded remarkably. Um, instead, um, he has really taught and exemplified the renunciate life or the monastic life um, as a life of great joy and nobility, a beautiful life worth living for its own sake. And Ajahn Chah's way of teaching was not that one would become a monk in order to meditate or one would practice and arrange things so that you could then meditate and have special experiences, but rather that you meditated in order to quiet your mind and open your heart so that then you could live wisely. And the whole orientation of the teaching is to use meditation and daily life and difficulty or whatever it is that arises in one's experience as the place of practice itself and the kind of inspiration that's come from his own joy in and commitment and dedication. Um, what he's embodied has drawn um, the largest Western monastic community, Buddhist Western community, to grow around him. Um, and uh, there's lots of other things I could say, but I'd rather let him speak instead. Um, it is a, a real treat to, to have Ajahn Sumedho around and visiting and, and here with us tonight. So. Thank you for that very nice introduction <laughs> and the, how people see you is uh, always a surprise sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and what people remember, I don't remember the bees at all. <laughs> <laughs> It's very um, my great uh, pleasure and, and feel very privileged to be able to come here and see the, 
this development because the last time I was in America was about four years ago, and I was here at Spirit Rock. There's only a, a tent. Now you have these very nice buildings, and uh, and they're all filled up with people. So, and I left the United States about 30 years ago, and the uh, to find anyone who's interested in Buddhism was uh, nearly impossible, or uh, who was practicing it anyway. And uh, I remember when I was a student at Berkeley, I look around for teachers or possibilities of of learning how to meditate, and and I was quite, uh, you know, very very interested in finding a teacher, but I couldn't find a teacher in the Bay Area. Mm. That was in 1962. 63. So, <coughs> and uh, in the graduate, I was in the graduate school. So, remember uh, telling somebody that I was really interested in in Buddhism and practicing meditation. They looked at me as if I, I was crazy. <laughs> so I decided maybe I better not let anyone know my these these kind of aberrant interests that I have, and I uh, kept quiet. <laughs> And most people didn't even understand what the word meditation meant. Um, but uh, now, of course, it's a uh, <coughs> uh, very respectable thing to be doing, and people, they, they talk about it. It's, a, it's a something that uh, is now a part of uh, uh, people's uh, expectation. They, they have a, now a, this possibility of, of uh, looking inward and of developing an awareness and a profound understanding of themselves and life and, the, and the try to look into the meaning and purpose of this strange experience that we all share. And I think many people wonder, what is it all about anyway, this, this uh, existence on this planet, living within this human form? What, does it have any meaning or purpose? Uh, what's it for? What's it about? What happens when we die? And these are the questions that, that uh, of course, we, we oftentimes expect people to answer for us. <coughs> people ask me, what happens when you die? And all I can say is, I don't know, I haven't died yet. <laughs> <laughs> and. They would, uh, and people can speculate about death and, and what happens. We can, we can, uh, you know, prefer various uh, ideas uh, and that people might have, such as being reincarnated, or, or we might uh, just drop off into oblivion, or we might go to heaven or hell or limbo. <laughs> Who knows what to expect? Uh, but uh, and we might. You know, I w I'm the oblivion type. I, I would prefer <laughs> oblivion. <laughs> I never never thought heaven would be something I'd want to participate in <laughs> forever. <laughs> and, uh, so I thought it'd be best just to, to to disappear into a void of nothingness and not exist. And that's probably what attracted me to Buddhism. <laughs> Being reincarnated was also, uh, I thought, it, you know, one could, uh, that was an, an interesting way to think, you know, that you have to, to kind of, you have opportunities uh, in each lifetime to, to develop or to degenerate or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but it wasn't all in, in, in just one lifetime that, that you, you, were, you were kind of stuck. If you made it in, or didn't make it in this one lifetime, you, you'd get a second chance. Or many other chances, so I thought reincarnation was a little more reasonable, a little more fair than than <laughs> just <laughs> uh, go for broke in one lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> but then, what I really know now, say about death, is that I don't know, and 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 so this is this is a the way of reflecting on 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 the way of knowing things. It's not knowing about or, or having information that you, you acquire from someone else or from books, but uh, in um, meditation we're learning to, say, 
awaken and observe the way things are. And this we don't generally do. We, we're not, uh, we, we generally have our own hidden agendas, our, our own axes to grind, uh, our own, we're primed for, for various uh, ways of looking. We have various prejudices, prejudgments, attitudes, assumptions that influence our experience. And so we, we, are, we, we end up projecting onto uh, experience all kinds of our own views, opinions, fears, and desires. And of course, this leads to endless confusion and conflict. We can trace all the problems that, that, that we personally have, or uh, the, that the, in the, on the international scene, uh, to this, this idea of projecting, creating a world out there uh, that comes from all kinds of assumptions, biases, misinformation, not understanding things properly. And so we, we develop, uh, uh, you know, we can get angry and hate somebody, not because they've actually done anything, but because uh, we've created uh, uh, that person in our mind. Uh, all these uh, kind of prejudices that people have are, are conditioned into the mind. Their, their attitudes, assumptions, uh, memories uh, that come from, the say, uh, usually from somebody else, or from seeing things in the wrong way. And so then we, we project uh, onto the people that we meet, the, if, we, if they have dark skin, or if they, whatever uh, kind of uh, appearance triggers off these, these uh, reactions, then we're, we're stuck with that. We're caught in uh, just helpless victims of our conditioning. And so the Buddha Dhamma is a way of awakening and and transcending that whole uh, world that we create. And this, the, the Buddha, when he's talking about the world, uh, it's the world that we create out of ignorance. And one time, I remember uh, one of the nuns at Dhammavati uh, came to me and was uh, very disturbed because she read in the suttas that the aim of a Buddhist uh, meditator is to realize the end of the world. And she says, Ajahn Samhita, uh, the end of the world. And uh, she thought, she, because she perceived that as, as, the, as a kind of, uh, you know, total annihilation of planet Earth. Our aim was maybe to get rid of the whole planet. Maybe the Buddhists are, you know, we're the real uh, destructive agent in this universe. <laughs> we're going to get rid of the whole planet, maybe the whole universe. But the world, in Buddhist terms, isn't, isn't planetary life, but the world of delusion that we create in our mind. So each one of us lives in a kind of world of our own. We all have our own kind of programs, our own assumptions. And these are oftentimes aligned with various others. We have cultural conditioning, ethnic attitudes, uh, uh, trends of the time, uh, the, these can be uh, influencing masses of people, but then we also have our own very personal uh, experience of life the, as an individual uh, being, and our own uh, tendencies and, and uh, uh, character tendencies that may be peculiar or, say, uh, to us alone and, and, and not be something that other people uh, have in common with us. But whatever it is, whether it's individual and personal, or uh, in groups and masses, in class, in races, in genders, in whatever it is, the, the, uh, the attachment to these perceptions, these views, these opinions, always influence and, and say, uh, prejudice our experience of life. So in Reflective meditation, when we're contemplating with the, using the uh, teachings of the Lord Buddha uh, uh, as a way of, of reminding us to look and examine, to look into uh, what experience really is. Because at this moment, at this present moment, we're, we are here and the time is now. And this is the experience of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a body that's conscious. It's a sensitive formation. 
this whole human individual body is an experience of total sensitivity. And we have to, from the time we're born, from the womb of our mother, uh, till the time this body dies, we are in this very vulnerable state, uh, in this very sensitive state, where we can, anything can happen to us, to this form. We live in, in this universe with all its mysteries and, and unknown factors and things that, that impinge and affect, attack or influence uh, this, this, form this sensitive formation in so many ways. So this is pointing to just the way it is. We, consciousness is, <coughs> is, uh, is a kind of knowing. We, we know things from this position. That we are, it's like each one of us is the center of the universe, is practically speaking. This isn't megalomania. <laughs> <laughs> but practically speaking, this is the center here, and, and uh, then the, the universe around us is uh, is the periphery. And this, this universe affects this center, wherever we are, isn't it? Wherever this body is, whether it's uh, sitting, standing, walking, or lying down, as long as it's living and breathing, then, then we, are, we are going to be uh, impinged upon. This form will, will receive impressions of pleasure, of pain, of beauty, of ugliness, of of, uh, we'll, we'll receive praise and blame, uh, we'll experience success and failure, uh, we'll have, uh, uh, we have the, this form is born, it's young, it grows up, gets old and, and dies, this, this, this is the nature of, say, this sensoric existence or conditioned existence. Now the delusion uh, that we all share is that we tend to identify with the death-bound conditions. We're, we're identified. We, we are, uh, every, almost every society uh, believes uh, and, and, and instills in us the assumptions that we are this human body. This is me. And uh, in, in this very materialistic time, uh, say Western uh, consumerism, uh, materialist attitudes, and 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 even uh, um, modern science, things are changing. But but these all these uh, uh, conventions that affect us tend to reinforce the sense of of our identity with mortality. I am this person, this body, this this being. I am my thoughts and my opinions. And we, uh, then we identify with, with the, the possessions we have, when, with all the, the things that, that we're told and, and uh, that we're conditioned with. So we identify with, with, uh, with a class, with a race, with a religion, with uh, all kinds of qualities of being attractive or unattractive, being uh, worthy or unworthy, being lovable or not lovable. Uh, we identify with uh, uh, the fact that we want we're, we're intelligent or not. So we acquire a sense of our self as being something that, that's good or bad or worthwhile or worthless or intelligent or stupid. And then we compare ourselves with others. And so we, have, we, we live in a society that's very competitive and where we are very much... Uh, uh, told that our worth, we have to prove our worth, what we do, what we've attained, the, how much money, our profession, our education, uh, all these things make me into somebody worth, worthwhile. And if I don't have any of these, then I'm, no, I'm worthless. So we, 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 we tend to have a lot of fear and anxiety about our very existence because we don't feel at ease or at rest in just being and in, in, in just the, the fact that we're living and breathing, conscious being. We're caught up in the rat race or in the, these stressful activities in which we constantly have to prove ourselves in some way, either to, to uh, convince ourselves we're okay or to convince others. 
So modern life is a, is a very stressful and, and painful experience. And of course we see, and in, in so many of us, have lived very privileged lives. In, uh, say, example, in, in my own background, I'm, I feel that I was always, in, compared to majority of people on this planet, uh, had a very privileged life. Had uh, all kinds of opportunities and, and freedom and, and um, not very many limitations placed on me or restrictions. Brought up in the American way. I'm free to do what I want. I'm an individual. I, I have my rights and I'm going to live this life as I want it and do what I want and enjoy it and, and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Nobody can stop me. <laughs> but when you, but when you uh, say, have lived in other countries where people don't have this expectation, people more or less have to conform and, and they have to put up with and, and learn how to survive or endure in, in poverty or in very basic uh, situations without any options or opportunities for anything else. And I feel how privileged my life has been. And yet, in spite of all that, there was so much misery, so much unhappiness and despair that I created, not because of anything in particular, like any great disasters or, or, or real uh, unfairness in my life, but just because I, w I, n I didn't know how, I didn't understand the Dharma, I didn't understand how things really are. So one acquired a whole way of just kind of going on in life, creating misery, creating suffering in, w in, in one's mind, because life couldn't be as perfect as you could imagine it. And of course we can all imagine what we would like, how it should be, the best of, say, how a society should be, how a man, a woman, how, um, how uh, Spirit Rock should be, how a monastery should be. We can, we can create in our mind images of, of these perfect forms, ideals that are, uh, because we can think in superlative ways. We can think of what is the best, the fairest, the most beautiful, what is utterly free and, and stainless. And we can, we can create ideals like this that, and then uh, compare the actual experience of life with an ideal. And all we can do is feel that something's wrong. So in, uh, say, living in monasteries, for example, is I've been through this because I had, when I first became an abbot uh, 20 years ago in Thailand, uh, what not I chat? I wanted to create the perfect monastery, <laughs> and I had an ideal. Uh, I could see I'd seen I'd lived at Thai monasteries, Ajahn Chah's monastery, and I thought I'm going to create. I've seen I, di I didn't like this. I didn't like certain things. I liked a lot of it, but there were certain things that I didn't quite approve of, and so forth. And I was going to uh, create this perfect monastery, and I haven't been able to do it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Now then, because uh, I, I, I failed at this mission, I'm a failure. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one way of looking at it, isn't it? I'm a failure because uh, here I, I had this opportunity and I've messed it all up. I've failed. I'm getting old now and it's too late. <laughs> And I don't see any prospect of, of being able to create a perfect monastery. Uh, all, all the monasteries that I influence are very imperfect. <laughs> but that's the point, isn't it? Is that, that this realm we live in isn't an ideal realm. We live in a changing, uh, dynamic flow of, of conditioning that is, that it's never never stops. It's always in the process of change and flux. And so, this realm we live in is not an ideal realm. It's it's this kind of realm. It's sense. It's a sense realm. It's sensitive. It hurts. It's a. It's an irritating, agitated realm. Is that when you've got a body like this, 
human body, it's something's always irritating it in some way. <laughs> It shouldn't be like that, but that... <laughs> <laughs> and I remember as a child, I was brought up as a Christian, I used to think, I don't think God did, did such a good job of creation, because <laughs> if I were to create a world, I'd, I, I'd create it perfect. <laughs> where there is no pain, and where there is no hunger, where, where everything was beautiful, there is no ugliness. Uh, there was, everything was fair, and everybody was, looked beautiful, and everybody was happy. And you only had delicious food, and you, you didn't have to take cod liver oil. <laughs> <laughs> My mother used to make us take cod liver oil <laughs> in a tin of spoon. It was horrible. I mean, now you, you're all so spoiled with these capsules. <laughs> Got to taste the stuff. It's really <laughs> dreadful. <laughs> so reflecting on the way things are is like dhamma. And the word dhamma is is a Pali word that means it's the truth of the way it is. And and so with meditation, where we're not trying to uh, say, develop, a, get into a trance where we just blot everything out and get very high into a very refined uh, state uh, where we don't feel the coarseness or the irritation uh, of, of that which is around us. But in, say, in meditation we're learning to, say, relax and trust and open to the suffering or the pain or the irritation, the frustration, uh, that we're, we're inevitably going to experience through this form. And so it's a very strange thing to be doing because I think most human beings really want, you know, we, we, we develop this society here, this, this consumer society, to, in order to make life as comfortable, as safe, as secure, as pleasant, as efficient, and, uh, and as beautiful, uh, as we can possibly make it. And uh, we, we, create, we tr try to create these perfect systems, democratic systems and economic systems. And then we have a monastery in Switzerland. And when you go to Switzerland, it seems to be the perfect country. Everything is what, how it should be. <laughs> well, it's very beautiful and and everything is, is efficient, and everything, and the clocks work, they're on time. <laughs> uh, everything is clean, and, uh, and uh, it's uh, at high quality. You don't see cheap, sleazy goods in Switzerland. <laughs> uh, it has these, uh, a, a very good democratic uh, governmental system that works. Very nice country, but people still complain endlessly in Switzerland. <laughs> in fact, they look more miserable than anyone else. <laughs> so that says something, isn't it? It's it's not to dismiss that or to to look down or to 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 uh, say anything's wrong with, with creating a clean and, and beautiful and efficient environment. But if, if our expectations lie in, in just arranging this world according to plans that come, that come out of our own heads and our ideas, then even if we're able to succeed at this, we still will, will experience suffering. We'll be very disappointed with this. Because that is not enough. That's that, that it takes a lot of effort to try to keep everything clean all the time and keep this world ordered according to our plans, the way I want it to be. All of you know this very well, to, to try to keep the world, your house, in order <laughs> according to the way you want it to be all the time and make it stay that way is an ongoing challenge, isn't it? <laughs> if you could just 
build a house and, and get it going in the right way, and it would stay that way <laughs> for years, <laughs> but they don't do that. It's, it's, it's experience with, it's in this changing realm, this impermanent realm. So we, we observe this. Change, then, is the way things are. What we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, think, feel, emotions, everything, this whole universal system uh, <coughs> that we're experiencing is the experience of, of relentless change. Now, when we contemplate impermanence or changingness, then we, we begin to, say, uh, look at the world and ourselves in a different way. Rather than, than kind of fixing it with, how, with ideals of how we want it to be and then feel disappointed because it, it isn't like that, we're, we're much more aware and appreciate the changing qualities, the changingness of nature. Even the changingness of the body, we, the, the aging process. It's very interesting to see how, you know, in the, in the Western world, we, we, we really are trying to petrify ourselves into a certain age group. <laughs> because we, we don't like change of, uh, in, in, in terms of the aging process of the body. If we could just kind of inject it with some kind of uh, youth serum that would preserve it in, say, 25, age 25, <laughs> and, uh, and stay that way forever. Uh, but or we, we, we try to, say, not notice that, or we, we can see that the, the aging process is something that, that we, uh, we would even not want to talk about very much. And yet, this aging of our own bodies is something that we need to understand. It's the, it's dhamma. It's the way things are, from birth until death. All conditions go through this process. They arise, they reach a peak like the inhalation, and then they exhale. It's like the exhalation. I'm on the exhaling side of life. <laughs> Downhill slide. <laughs> And yet, the downhill slide, the exhaling, or the aging process, instead of being uh, comparing it with an inhalation, you're with the actual uh, exhalation, or you're with the, with the aging process. And when you're with it, you're, you're no longer identifying with it. You're not comparing it with, with an inhalation or with, with youth, but you you're are learning, and you are open to this experience that... that is, uh, that is uh, uh, inevitable, that we cannot, uh, say, stop, because this is the way it is, until death. So then, all of us in the future will die. Say, in a hundred years, all of you will be dead. <laughs> <laughs> Sooner than that. Yeah. <laughs> So death is what is the end of what begins. And as long as our identities and attachments are with birth, with the body, uh, with things that change, with thoughts, with views, with ideas, with ideals, with emotions, uh, with this whole realm of change, then we're, we, then we always have this fear and anxiety and discontentment because we're we are identified with death. Now, when I said before, uh, when, when, a, when somebody asks me, what happens when you die? And I say, I don't know because I haven't died yet. What I'm also pointing to is the fact that we're now experiencing uh, life. Life is like this. And but life isn't, isn't something that, uh, say, is just, uh, uh, to, uh, just a, a condition that is death-bound. But we are awakening to, say, what we call the Dhamma, or the deathless. So, 
the deathless is, is a realization that all religions point to in their own way. And it, it's a realization, it's not, it, that's why it's, it's something you, you realize, it's a reality. It's not something you believe in, or it's not an image, you can't make an image, you can't, it's not an ideal. That's why when somebody says, uh, describe Nibbana, or the deathless, your mind goes blank, because it's, it, it's, 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 it's not with attributes, it's not, attributes all, are all about change. If you have goodness, you have badness. If you have right, you have wrong. The, the attributes, the conditions, are, are, go in pairs, and they depend on each other. Where when, we, when we're contemplating deathlessness, <coughs> or the immortal, the deathless reality, then that we can only realize through, say, Letting go of the death-bound conditions, of the changing conditions. That mean, doesn't mean getting rid of them, it doesn't mean uh, destroying anything, but it means letting go, releasing this, this uh, fatal grip, this, uh, this grasping, and identification with the body, with your own body, with the, uh, with the sensitivity, that it, that it has, with the uh, conditioned thoughts and views, with the experience of consciousness. And this we can do through, say, mindfulness. So the Buddha was pointing to something that is extraordinarily simple, that we all actually uh, do much of the time. We, I mean, we'd, we would all be dead by now if we were never mindful be run over by a car or you know something we would just uh, because if we're, we're not mindful then we we we're, we're, we cannot survive in any way but because mindfulness is such a an integral part of our experience of life uh, we don't really understand it we don't we 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 we're, we're mindful under conditions say for example when your life is in danger then you become very mindful. And when you're, when you're uh, rock climbing, I mean, you become very mindful when you're rock climbing. Or when you're walking on a glacier, you're, you become very mindful. If, um, if a rabid dog is chasing you, you become very mindful. <laughs> if you're told the moth is after you, you become very mindful. <laughs> We become mindful in extreme situations, uh, out of out of just to, in order to survive. But then, in modern life, we can live. We can be live very heedlessly, because we've created a realm of of security that we can just kind of flop into and be totally heedless. We can, uh, and this I see, and I say. Uh, living in England for for eighteen years, you and, and you see a, a society that's created a, a, a welfare system that will carry its population along, a whole way of of just carrying people along, so they don't have to put any effort into life at all. If you just don't want to be bothered doing things, you just can depend on the state, uh, and it will carry you through your life. You, don't, you, don't, you aren't forced by circumstances to kind of scavenge or go out and, and try to, to, to make it or just survive because, uh, say, modern uh, democratic systems, social systems, uh, welfare systems, uh, will carry their citizens from birth until death. Now, I'm not against this. I'm all for it. I like living there. there. Very nice country. I'm very grateful for the welfare state. But also I can see that, that, that in, say, modern societies, affluent societies, we, something in us can just uh, kind of uh, take advantage of the system and just get by in a very mediocre way. 
and 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 of course we don't respect ourselves we suffer depression we we have all kinds of neurotic problems because we're living a life in which we're we're just we're not the best of us is not being challenged and we're not we're not putting forth an effort to understand or to look deeply because we can survive just by uh, the least amount of effort until maybe something happens and for the, in uh, this month they had the the 50 year anniversary of the end of the of BE day uh, end of the of the uh, European war and people tell me in in London during the second world war uh, people there was great community spirit because the city was being bombed it was dangerous and everybody was out there helping each other. They were very mindful. Uh, there was, uh, they were, everybody was looking after each other. There was no kind of crime. That they weren't ripping each other off or stealing. Uh, but people, were, neighbors were, were, were really concerned, helping each other in a neighborly way. And, and, and it's surprising how some people tell me, those were wonderful days. Because now London isn't like that. It's a big city where you, you have to lock your door, chains and burglar alarms and all the rest. You can't trust anybody. But it is, there, there's not the, the immediate dangers either, of like bombs uh, suddenly being dropped. Except we hope or the MRA gave us some, uh, I mean the uh, IRA gave us some, uh, some things to uh, be agitated about. <laughs> but notice this, that, that in modern life sometimes we, we degenerate into, uh, into just uh, a complaining, dissatisfied, discontented uh, kind of beings in which we, our lives become increasingly meaningless and depressing. And so you find in, in, in affluent societies a lot of depression, drug addiction, alcoholism, mental breakdowns. They're so common, in, like in Western European countries. There's, there's so much uh, mental illness in societies that are very secure and well-run with all kinds of advantages uh, that make life uh, very pleasant. That's one reason why I think I, I gravitated toward monasticism. I like, the, I like the challenge. Living in Northeast Thailand, and eating uh, frogs and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> having to force yourself to do things that you didn't want to do, and uh, having bees covering your body, <laughs> and uh, living under tin roofs in the hot season, and things like this where, uh, where you had to survive uh, well, did you know one one had to kind of rally oneself and and kind of rise up to a life in which sometimes you you felt you didn't you know you you if, if, say if I uh, lived the way I was living before I wouldn't have bothered I could get by in a measure of comfort and ease just with with not putting much effort into my life what I found in like in the monastic life it, it was a one had to rise up and be better than one oftentimes felt, or that one would would do if 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 I, if I wasn't a monk. One lives, say, under a very uh, elaborate discipline. Uh, so, and and being American, you're not used to being disciplined. <laughs> so you're not have you're not used to having uh, kind of. Uh, borders or boundaries placed on your actions or speech. You, I'm free, I can do what I want, uh, get out of my way, the wide open spaces, <laughs> give me a home where the buffalo roam. <laughs> Not like that in a Buddhist monastery, you got always, you can't do this, can't do that. <laughs> so you're always, you're feeling the sense of being oppressed by, by discipline and convention. But the but the beauty of the system lies in that, that it does, you begin to see what you're, you're creating, the suffering you're creating in your mind. And, and so Ajahn Chah is very good at pointing it out. He'd say things like, he'd come up and suddenly say, is what Bapong suffering? You know, you remember 
uh, feeling, this sense of this place, I can't stand it anymore. I don't like it here. It's too hot. I hate the food. Uh, I want to go someplace where there's better food. I want to go someplace where there's uh, cooler weather uh, and where you don't have to do any work. <laughs> and then uh, when you're in this kind of horrible mood, then Ajahn Chah kind of, he'd kind of tune in and he'd say something. So one time he said, is what about Pong suffering? And, the, and the, it hit me, you know, because I then began to see that, I thought, no, it's, it's, it's all right. What about Pong, all this I can bear, the heat, the, the work, the food, all this, I can take this. This is not, this isn't something uh, that, uh, I would, that I would say is, is causing me suffering. I'm creating suffering. It's my, it's what I produce onto all this. This is the misery of my life. And we began to see very clearly uh, how I could create such negative reactions to, to food, to the, to the weather, to the situation, to, to even very good things. I could get very critical of Ajahn Chah. I could start, you know, once you get over your kind of romance and, and you think he's perfect, then you begin to see, uh, well, you know, I don't know about this, and I don't know about that. And then so you create these, these doubts and, and uh, criticisms, and then you, you, am I wasting my time here? You know, or maybe I should go someplace else where, where, the, where the teacher is perfect. <laughs> But this, this uh, just to, this evening, just to, to share this with you, of, uh, of say, the, the, to encourage you in, towards this, this kind of practice, because it is something that uh, you will never regret doing if you, you know, if you, if you develop it. Because the, this, this kind of teaching is something that, that encourages an openness, an honesty, and a, a very direct looking at, at, the, at the most ordinary things that we do and feel as, as human individuals, but which sometimes we, we don't even notice. I mean, we tend to be looking for the extremities of experience, you know, highs, and we want, we want real happiness, and we want, uh, and we want extreme, we want real excitement, and really interesting things to do, fascination. Uh, we want romances and adventures and, and things that really, you know, excite the mind. And, and therefore, we want security and comfort and beauty and all the rest. These are the extremities of the conditioned realm that we tend to see. And when, but if you get happiness, you're also going to get suffering. They, they go in pairs. Because the, the, these are impermanent conditions. But then the ability of a human individual to understand this experience, and this is what the Buddha is pointing to, to a profound understanding. And this is possible within this human state. The human mind is a reflective mind, isn't it? We, we can, we, uh, Life is going, can be very pleasant or very unpleasant, but we are aware of it. And we can be aware of our own reactions to it. We can, we can contemplate the, this sensitive state that we're in. If we were just helpless victims in a system that we had no, we, you know, just dependent upon conditions being pleasant in order, uh, and then when they change, we're just helplessly lost in, in misery, and then we have to try to find happiness again. If we're just going up and down on the, on the scale of happiness and suffering, or pleasure and pain, then, then life is a, 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 a rotten joke. It's a bad deal. But the, the, the liberating teaching of the Buddha is that, that no matter what happens to us, is that we, we have the ability to, say, transcend it. And that doesn't mean 
rejecting or, or running away, but in understanding it. And, and so what life provides for us, which, or what that which happens to us in this life from birth to death, uh, we can bear whatever happens. We're tough creatures. We can survive. We have the enormous ability. We're resilient and we can adapt to all kinds of things. The human beings are very adaptable, very resilient, tough creatures. Whether you know that or not, <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> no. But also, they. So, in this way, what I'm I'm trying to say is that don't worry about life and make a problem about it when about disease or old age or loss or or earthquakes or fires or or floods. It's like they have so many here in California. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they have uh, all kinds of, of natural catastrophes. We hear about them in England. <laughs> and uh, these things are, I mean, to, to be mindful, they help, they, they, people are get, become very mindful when these things are going on. But also, don't make a problem about life. Don't, don't worry about it. But, but because this is a very temporary uh, journey that we're on. And it's not meant to be a place where, where we're going to uh, find uh, a, a sense of uh, real security. The, the very nature of this realm is insecure, uncertain. That's its nature. That's not, that's not your neurosis. That's just the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> but your strength lies not in dependency upon the condition, but your realization of the of the amata or the deathless, and and so this is this human. We we have this ability to me, to have that realization in this lifetime, and the Lord Buddha was the example of that. Where when on we had the Visakha Puja celebration, the full moon of May last thirteenth uh, of June, thirteenth of May, and this is the celebration of the birth, enlightenment, death of the Lord Buddha. On one day, 13th of May, he was born on the 13th of May, and he was enlightened on the 13th of May, and he died on the 13th of May, or the full moon of May, anyway. And we say, impossible. Uh, Theravada Buddhism is just full of these uh, <laughs> silly kind of impossibilities, you know. <laughs> Nobody can, can do that all on the same day, full moon of May. <laughs> but that's not the point, isn't it? It's not to be, prove it historically. But to reflect upon that, birth and death is something we all experience. We've all been born, we're all going to die. And what is possible between those two extremes, between birth and death for any of us, is enlightenment. <coughs> and so this is, this is your opportunity to, to say, awaken to life itself and to, to uh, develop your capacity for wisdom and deep understanding of this very strange uh, experience of human birth and consciousness and this, this, uh, this realm that we all must uh, bear with until we understand it and then no longer identify and attach to it. So I offer this as a reflection for you this evening and uh, uh, I hope that uh, all of you will uh, contemplate what I've said and, uh, and uh, all of you will be enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> so when the death day comes, uh, all that will die is the body and you don't, have, don't make any fuss about that. <laughs> <laughs> So I'd like to um, thank Ajahn Sumedho, make a few announcements, and then ask if he would end with a chant in a minute. The announcements are that beginning June 5th and throughout the summer, the Monday night children's program will be by pre-registration only, and you can re-register by seeing Seth on Monday nights or by calling the office and dialing his voicemail and letting him know. Um, the next senior student's class on Sunday is on the subject of of karma, led by Anna Douglas. 
Um, and uh, one more announcement, there are a couple of baskets on the table as you leave for donations, both to uh, Tana John Sumedho and to Spirit Rock. The tradition for 2,000 and more years is that teachings be offered as openly as possible. And at the same time, there's a spirit um, of supporting that which is valuable or making um, spiritual centers and teachings uh, available and sustaining them in such a way that they are there as a refuge in, in the society. So when you go to Asia, there are temples and places to practice and study that are open to whoever would like to come because people in those societies so deeply value the opportunity for spiritual cultivation. And we'd like to do that as best as we can here to keep things either free or at a minimum cost and your donations are gratefully accepted as part of that cycle. Um, so perhaps if Tana John Sumedho would end with a bit of a blessing chant. Saparo kavini modho sapa santa bhava jito sapa vera mati ganto ni puto jato va.